This presentation is provided by the Broward County Environmental Planning and Community Resilience Division on the 2019 Unified Sea Level Rise Projection provided by the Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact. The compact is a collaborative of local government staff from Broward County, Palm Beach County, Miami-Dade County, and Monroe County focused on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and preparing for climate change by building climate resilience. Sea level has risen for thousands of years. For the past 100 years, water levels have been measured in Key West. This tide gauge has the longest record in Florida. The blue lines show the monthly mean average of sea level. See that it varies considerably month to month across seasons and year to year? To make the trend in sea level rise more obvious, the monthly data points are averaged across five-year periods, shown by the black line. The black line makes it easy to see that sea level rise is not linear. It does not follow a straight line path or even a smooth curve. Some years, it accelerates rapidly. Some years, it stays the same, and sometimes it can even decrease slightly before increasing again. Overall, sea level is about 11 inches higher in 2017, at the end of the black line, than it was in 1913 at the beginning of the line. And this record confirms sea level is rising. So we came over to this section of the seawall so I could explain what mean sea level is. So it's not low tide, it's not high tide, but it's actually the midpoint in between the two. In South Florida, we get it about two and a half feet uh, between the very low tide and the high tide, every day, twice a day. And when we reference sea level rise projection, it's always referenced from the mean sea level and the sea level rise projections that we use. So that's important to remember because if you want to understand where water levels will be in the future, you need to start from mean sea level, add high tides, add the king tide, then add sea level rise, and then you have an understanding of where future water levels will be. And I also wanted to point out behind me uh, you can actually see watermarks on the wall. So that's where previous high tides have been. So just to illustrate that we know water levels go up and down every day. That's why we need mean sea level so that we're using an average across the entire year, across even decades, so that we can reference things uh, from the same elevation. This graph shows the change in sea level in inches by decade. In the 1930s and 40s, sea level rose two inches per decade. In the 50s and 60s, it did not change much. Then, from the 70s through the 2000s, it rose about an inch per decade. In the 2010s, the rate of sea level rise significantly accelerated, rising over three inches in a single decade. This rise caught the attention of the community. During the highest tides of the year and storms, water levels were now high enough to flood over backyards and seawalls and onto roads and into neighborhoods. The news and news and media and policymakers started talking about king tides causing nuisance flooding. It also provided a preview of what the next foot of sea level rise would look like on a daily basis. Returning to this graph, it helps to understand why it is very important for the community to know that sea level is rising, how fast it is rising, and for Southeast Florida as a whole to plan sea level rise adaptation together. As an example, the walls and roads built in the 1960s were designed assuming the water level did not change. This assumption was incorrect, and now those buildings and areas are vulnerable to flooding. By having a unified sea level rise projection for the Southeast Florida region, the community can build smarter today, having an understanding of what sea level rise will be in the future and avoiding flooding, damage, and disruption. One last note. Looking at the past helps us to understand the, that the rate of sea level rise changes over time and justifies updating the region's future projection regularly. The Southeast Florida Regional Climate Change Compact updates the projection every five years. As greenhouse gas emissions increase, sea level rise will accelerate, and the community needs to plan for that acceleration. Here is an example of infrastructure built several decades ago that was vulnerable to high tide flooding as shown in the video on the left. The city of, Fort La of Ho Hollywood adapted to the tidal flooding and rebuilt the marina and boat ramps at a higher elevation based on the unified sea level rise projection to ensure it is usable into the future. 
One reason acceleration was observed locally in the recent decade can be explained by the slowing of the Gulf Stream currents passing by Florida. When the Gulf Stream moves fast, it pulls the elevation of the ocean down, just like when you move your hand through the bathtub and the water immediately behind your hand is lower than the rest of the tub. When the Gulf Stream moves slower because of global and ocean warming, the top of the ocean is higher along the coast of Florida, making sea level rise higher locally than it is across the globe. Such observations justify the need for a regional projection for Southeast Florida, since certain processes are causing higher sea level rise here than in other places in the world. Globally, sea level rise is caused by the Earth's temperature warming as greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel use prevent heat from escaping the atmosphere into space. As the planet warms, glaciers melt, adding water to the ocean, and the ocean itself expands since molecules in warmer liquids take up more space than cooler liquids. While these are the overarching processes forcing change, there are additional processes that are initiated in response that cause sea level rise to speed up or slow down over shorter time periods. Processes driving sea level rise are complex and a challenge to replicate with a computer models. A few of the challenges include modeling the acceleration of ice melt, predicting the rate that frozen ground or permafrost will melt, and predicting how clouds form and warm or cool the earth. The physics of the processes need to be understood. Models need to represent the physics accurately, and observations and measurements must be collected for use in model calibration and validation, all before our models can accurately project what sea level rise will be in the future. The scientific community's understanding of these processes continues to improve and models advance, but there is still some uncertainty in what future sea levels will precisely be. However, despite some uncertainty, the scientific community agrees on a range of predictions, allowing them to be interpreted by policymakers and used in design for climate adaptation. How quickly the processes happen will drive whether the higher sea level rise or lower sea level rise projections will be correct. Glaciers start to melt because of warm, warm air temperatures. However, meltwater passing under and over glaciers can accelerate melting faster than warm air temperatures alone. If all of the glaciers melted after 13,000 years or so, it would account for about 20% of the total global sea level rise that could occur. The greater cause of sea level rise will be the melting of permafrost. Approximately 16% of the Earth's ground is frozen. When the air is warm and winters are shorter, the top layers of the frozen ground melt. Once melted, microbes that have been frozen for thousands of years wake up and start eating the organic material in the soil. As they eat, they warm up and melt even more of the soil next to them. They create so much heat by eating that even if the winter is cold enough to freeze the ground, again, it will not. These microbes produce carbon dioxide and methane as they eat, releasing more greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, causing global warming and sea level rise to accelerate even faster. This process would cause more sea level rise than even all of the glaciers melting. The world's leading scientists regularly convene to review the latest science and provide projections of future conditions. The Southeast Florida Unified Sea Level Rise Projection is based on the guidance provided by the publications of the scientific community, as well as the consensus of a local work group of academic experts and federal and local government staff. The key documents referenced for the Unified Sea Level Rise Projection include the last Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Update from 2013, the 2018 National Climate Assessment, and the 2019 IPCC paper on oceans. The IPCC Fifth Assessment Report includes modeled projections of global emissions, emissions and sea level rise. The 2018 National Climate Assessment provides regional projections of sea level rise and climate impacts. The 2019 IPCC Summary Paper on Oceans provides new estimates of sea level rise based on observations, but not new modeling yet. The Unified Sea Level Rise Projection is shown before you. 
It includes four curves and highlights the 20-year planning horizon at 2040 and the 50-year infrastructure lifespan horizon at 2070. If a brand new building is built, it is assumed to last about 50 years before the materials need to be replaced or the building is at risk of failure. The projections start from mean sea level in year 2000. However, on this graph, you'll see that we have plotted the observed data averaged over five-year intervals from 1992 to 2017, since we had that data available. So although the, the projections, these curves, actually start in 2000, you don't actually see them on the graph until 2020. These are regional projections for Southeast Florida. These are not global sea level rise projections, and that was an improvement over previous iterations. Starting at the bottom, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, median curve is the lowest curve of the unified sea level rise projection. The IPCC models a range of emissions pathways or scenarios to represent how many emissions society will release over time. Based on these different emissions pathways, sea level rise curves are de derived. Simply, more concentrated emissions correlates to greater sea level rise. The IPCC median curve is based on the average of all of the sea level rise curves produced for the representative concentration pathway 8.5, the pathway that assumes we do not make global reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and continue our lifestyles as, as usual. This curve was slightly modified for Southeast Florida based on regional processes. The next curve moving up is the NOAA Intermediate High Curve, followed by the NOAA High Curve and the NOAA Extreme Curve. In the next few slides, we'll talk about how to apply these curves, but I want to note that the recommendation is not to apply the NOAA Extreme Curve at the very top. That curve is to encourage discussion about the importance of reducing emissions so that we do not actually realize this level of sea level rise. As you can see, it's over 10 feet of sea level rise, which would mean drastic changes for our community. So we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so that we don't actually see this level of sea level rise, but it's useful to see what the upper bound of potential sea level rise is based on the existing models. To determine sea level rise for a given year, Look at the year of interest on the x-axis. This could either be an event date, it could be the date of construction, it could be the end of life for the structure, remember 50 years from the day it was built, or it could be the end of when your uh, plan, planning horizon. If you're making a plan for 20 years, it would be the end of your 20-year planning horizon. Then you go across to find the relative sea level rise on the y-axis for the curve that is relevant to your project. How to apply the curves. First, the blue shaded zone between the IPCC median and the NOAA intermediate high curve, the two lowest curves on the unified sea level rise projection, should be used for most projects especially projects with a life expectancy of less than 50 years, meaning they will be replaced by 2070. Projects that are easy to replace, maybe it's a, a pipeline that is gonna be replaced every 10 years, um, or maybe it's adaptable infrastructure. It's a seawall that you can add a cap to in order to make it higher to resist tidal flooding during this 50-year horizon. Also, it should be for projects that have limited interdependencies. If it's a piece of infrastructure that many different business sectors or property owners um, or even other pieces of infrastructure are connected to, then it would be considered to have high interdependency. And if it fails, all of those uh, connected uh, sectors and pieces of infrastructure would be at risk of failure as well. 
So if something is going to be only around for less than 50 years, it's easy to replace. And if it fails, it really only affects a small portion of the community, then you should be using this blue zone. To decide what actual sea level rise value you use within the blue shaded zone, you need to weigh the potential benefits versus the additional cost. So there may be a benefit to build to the full 40 inches in 2070 because you will have reduced insurance premium. You could avoid some uh, damage as a result of tidal flooding or maybe even storms and flooding. And if there is a failure, you're really having a reduced uh, disruption to the community, meaning that the community around it can still function. You have to decide if those benefits are worth the additional cost it will take in order to build the infrastructure higher or to a more robust standard to handle more volume of water or uh, resist corrosion uh, from the salt water more effectively. If you do not need to spend, if, if you don't have the budget or you don't feel that the project is worthy of the additional cost, then you need to be prepared for the consequences of underdesigning and acknowledge that your equipment or infrastructure may need to be replaced sooner than it was fully intended. If you have critical infrastructure that is risk intolerant, meaning that it cannot be allowed to fail, an example of this may be the nuclear power plants uh, in, in Miami. It may be the uh, wastewater treatment plants that are near the coast. It could even be a, a government center or government infrastructure that is essential to continuing operation of, of our, our municipalities. Or it could be infrastructure that you know will be in place longer than 50 years. This may be a railroad. It could be our canal floodgates. It could even be um, some of our buildings. For example, the building I'm standing in has been here longer than that. So if that's the case and you cannot adapt it or move it or replace parts of it to make it more resilient, then you need to be planning for a more conservative or higher rate of sea level rise and use the NOAA high curve. This chart shows how the new projection aligns with observed data since year 2000. The gray and black lines are based on measurements from the Key West tide gauge. The blue lines are the IPCC median and the NOAA intermediate high projections. From 2000 to 2013, the trend in the observed data followed about the IPCC median. After 2013, the trend was between the two projections. This comparison validates the use of the projection. Also, since the projection is based on mean sea level, it highlights that water levels will actually be higher, much higher than the projections depending on tides and weather. So you can see these gray lines are actually much higher than the projection is. So we're at uh, downtown Fort Lauderdale. It's Tuesday, April 28th. High tide is actually coming in. High tide will be here in just a few minutes at 12.30 p.m. And so as you can see, the water is getting closer and closer to the top of the seawall. So right now, if I measure it with my measuring tape, it looks like the top of the seawall is maybe only two feet away from the top. So it's April and the tides are not as high as they could be. Um, in fall, like September, October, November, we actually get what we call king tides. And instead of having 24 inches, of clearance we've got um, actually only eight inches because between the tide of that part of the season plus the, the higher king tides you've really gone and got eight inches between the top of the water and the top of the seawall and if there's a storm or high winds and more water is moving in to the intercoastal and into this river um, and being pushed up against the walls we actually get overtopping over this wall and you'll get some water into the street and so that's requiring us to adapt. So we have moved over to where the new seawall is along Riverwalk, uh, where they've already started adaptation to sea level rise. And I just measured to the water level again, and we're actually 20 inches higher 
above the water than we were at the previous point. And so I wanted to point out, this is one of the oldest landmarks in downtown Fort Lauderdale, the Stranahan House. And so they have had to adapt to sea level rise because they already were experiencing the high tide flooding. And so they built this new seawall so that the waves don't overtop it. And they built this deck because the water was actually going through and still flooding the ground. And so they needed to really be up. What's gonna happen over time is as new development comes in, they're gonna want even more elevation than this property is at. So this is a historic property. It's really hard to lift a historic property. Uh, there's rules and codes that restrict that. And maybe it's not a decision that they wanted to make today. But if you have a new development, they're actually building staircases and elevating the whole property five feet above where we're standing on this new seawall. So that's giving them, you know, almost seven feet of clearance from where today's water levels are. And that is in response and preparation for what future sea level rise will be, which we'll talk about um, planning for multiple feet over the next uh, 30 years. It is critical to notice what elevation datum from which a projection is referenced. Since sea level changes every second, fixed reference points have been established so builders, surveyors, and others can have a common understanding of how high something is off the ground. The elevation datum used in Broward County and most of the U.S. is North American vertical datum of 1988. To explain the usefulness of this datum, let's click through the different elevations of interest. Mean sea level represents the local mid-tide for a certain time period. It's much simpler to tell a builder to build at minus 0.8 feet NAVD 88, a fixed elevation point, rather than asking him to measure from the midpoint between the high and low tide as it occurred approximately in year 2000, or actually the average between the 1991 and 2010 uh, sea level period this is actually the 20 year range that represents the tidal epic that the 2000 mean sea level uh, elevation is determined from. Remember, 2000 mean sea level is the starting elevation for the unified sea level rise projection. Mean high water represents high tide. And correlates to 0.5 feet NAVD 88 and it's almost 1.5 feet higher than mean sea level. Mean low water represents low tide, which is about a foot lower than mean sea level. The mid tide today, or 2017, as close to today as the five-year average can get, is approximately minus 0.5 feet NAVD. In 2070, According to the NOAA Intermediate High projection of 40 inches above the 2000 mean sea level, mid tide can be at, will be at 2.5 feet NAVD. Sea level rise can be referenced from mean low water, mean sea level, mean high water, or NAVD 88. The difference between these datums is significant, and it's very important to always understand what the reference point is to clearly understand how different water levels will be in the future. These are the frequently asked questions related to the unified sea level rise projection. Where can I get data for the curves? The curves as well as the guidance document are posted on the compact website, southeastfloridaclimatecompact.org. The guidance document itself contains all the values for the curves. The curves can be reproduced using the US Army Corps of Engineers sea level rise calculator online and selecting the NOAA curves and the location of Key West. Also, the observed data, the five-year average observed data, comes from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers sea level rise tracker online application. What are projected elevations in NAVD? This is listed in the guidance document. And for example, in 2040, the uh, projected elevation of, of mean sea level is 0.6 NAVD. In 2070, it's 2.5 NAVD based on the NOAA intermediate high curve. And in 2020, 2120, it's 10.5 feet NAVD based on the NOAA high curve. 
which areas will be inundated and what will inundation look like. The sea level rise sketch planning tool, also available online, can help understand which areas will be inundated by sea level rise within our county. Also, I shared some examples of areas that were inundated by high tide flooding. This is what inundation will look like on a daily basis in those areas unless adaptation occurs. Where are the tide gauges in South Florida? There is a tide gauge located in Fort Lauderdale at the Port Everglades site. Uh, it's actually called South Port Everglades if you're on the NOAA website. The sea level rise projection discussed today is actually based on the Key West tide gauge. There are also gauges in Virginia Key, Miami Beach, Vaca Key, and there are regional gauges local tide gauges in Pompano Beach, Deerfield, Hollywood, and Fort Lauderdale that have much shorter uh, records. What is projected sea level rise relative to today's sea level? Simplest way to approach this, and this is in the guidance document, is to subtract three or four inches uh, from the, the projected rise and make sure to always note what elevation datum you're working in. When will the next update be? So the update to the uh, Unified Sea Level Rise projection is based on the updated science that's available. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is anticipated to release its next assessment report, the sixth assessment in 2022. The North American vertical, vertical Datum 88, the elevation datum we discussed today, is anticipated to be updated in possibly 2024 and it's expected that the compact will update this unified sea level rise projection in the next four or five years, so by 2025. For more information and details on the unified sea level rise projection and the methodology for how it was developed and guidance for application, along with a state of science update on all the information that was used to derive the projection, visit Southeast Florida Climate compact.org for the guidance document. Also, you can always reach out to resilience at broward.org for questions related to Broward's climate resilience program. Thank you.